The church is not a select circle of the immaculate, but a home where the outcast may come in. It is not a palace with gate attendants and challenging sentinels along the entranceways, holding off at arm's length the stranger, but rather a hospital where the brokenhearted may be healed, and where all the weary and troubled may find rest and take counsel together. Well, good morning and welcome to South Crest. How's everybody doing today? Crispy. Well, that's good. That's good. We're glad you're here this Labor Day weekend. You know, Labor Day being the first Monday of September, it's a time for us to take a break, right? It's from work and, and to celebrate all that we have accomplished in our jobs as American workers. Labor Day is a, is a, is a way we celebrate a tribute to the contribution that so many people have made to the strength, prosperity, and well-being of our country. Actually, on, on June 28th, 1894, President Glover Cleveland signed a law making the first Monday of September of each year a national holiday. He said this as he was inducting that law. A truly American sentiment recognizes the dignity of labor and the fact that honor lies in honest toil. Now, in 1908, the first five-day work week in the United States was instituted by a New England cotton mill so that the Jewish workers could have the Sabbath day off. And then in 1926, Henry Ford began shutting down his automotive lines uh, all of Saturday and Sunday. The rest of the United States slowly kind of followed in, and uh, it was not until 1940 that a maximum 40-hour work week went into effect, right? Uh, work is good. Work gives us purpose. It, it can give us direction in our life. It, it can add value to what we do. But too much work can be destructive. Like many things in our life, too much of a good thing can become bad. And in today's day and age, we seem to be reversing the history of Labor Day. We seem to be working. I'm sure some of you, when I said a maximum 40-hour work week, may have chuckled to yourself. Because you're like, I would love to only work 40 hours this week, right? We've changed what that looks like. Our jobs can be overwhelming. Those demands can be stressful. Whether it's an advertising professional working day and night to ensure that their presentation is, is perfect. Maybe it's a software developer who's got some bug in their system and is spending an insane amount of hours trying to, to fix that problem there. Or a teacher who just has piles of homework to grade. We seem to be putting work more and more into the limelight and those long hours can take a toll on nearly every aspect of our life, including our personal relationships. Increasingly in the United States, many marriages are suffering under the strains of overwork. Too many hours in the office leaves little time at home to nurture and to love your spouse. Stress from work can cause arguments and conflicts at home. Frequent traveling can result in alienation. And these and other problems associated with overwork can unfortunately damage a relationship significantly, sometimes even beyond repair. And guys, this should not be. Our spouse should be our most significant earthly relationship, not our work. Our relationship with our spouse should be second only to our relationship with God himself. And today we will see this illustrated as we look at the church as the bride of Christ. Now, we've been walking through this series. I, some of you may have begun to notice that something's happening here, right? The very first week, we talked about the body of Christ. Last week, we talked about the family of Christ. And today, we're talking about the church as the bride of Christ. As we've been walking through this series, we begin to get more intimate in our relationship with Christ. We're beginning to get closer and closer to him as what the church should be as we've come through this series. It's, it's no longer just about the body or the family. Now, we're going to be talking about how we are the bride of Christ. Now, when Angie and I started uh, dating back in college, uh, we didn't know each other very well at all. 
Uh, I was a slacker from her calculus class who just kind of argued with the teacher all the time. And she was the one who studied all the time and got like really good grades because like apparently in college that's important. I don't know. But you know, that's what she focused in on. And and we began to to get to know each other. And over time, uh, I began to win her over. or wear her down. I don't know. One of the two. But eventually, she agreed to go on a date with me. And it was in October. And it was our first date. And we went to dinner and a movie, which is a really dumb thing to do for a first date. Because you know what happens in a movie? No talky-talky. You just watch the movie, right? But I made up for it, because afterwards, we went to TCBY. And we talked for hours. Now, some of you are shaking your heads, yes, TCBY. Others are like, I have no clue what you're talking about. TCBY is the country's best yogurt. Whether or not it actually was the country's best yogurt, I don't know. But it was pretty good, okay? And for those of you who are just wondering, there are still about 350 open around the nation. I I looked it up because I was just curious because I haven't seen a TCBY in so long. But yes, so you can go to TCBY still. But we we went there. I mean, we talked for like three hours after that movie at TCBY. And and we got to get to know each other better. And we grew closer and closer over time. And as that happens, as we continue to date each other, you know, we began to do things things that couples do to get to know each other better. Like, we got to get meet each other's families. You know, that's a big deal. And, and we would sp- start doing things together at school, like we would study together. Scratch that. Angie would study, and I would play the N64 in her bedroom that she bought me for my birthday, okay? That's, we would spend proximity together. She was studying, I was playing video games. Um, but, you know, it worked, and we got to know each other better, and we continued to get closer and closer over time. And then one day... I got the nerve to ask her to marry me. And by the way, for all of those of you who doubt, she said yes without hesitation, okay? It wasn't like, hey, will you marry me? And she was like, I don't know anything about that some more, okay? No, she she said yes pretty quickly. And, And as the wedding day approached, I looked forward to the day that she would be my bride. You know, it was awesome that she was my girlfriend, and it was special that she was my fiance, but the fact that she was gonna be my bride, my my wife, that was life changing. And I can remember our wedding day well. We got married at two o'clock that day. So I made sure I set my alarm for noon so I could be up in time to go to the wedding and be there at one o'clock at the church. And I think Angie got up like at six that morning because she's like, parents, she had to get her hair did and makeup did and get everything ready. But I, I did. I woke up by noon. I was good. It was great. I had a one, one bedroom apartment and it had no windows. So sleeping till noon was not a problem. It was, it was fantastic. Uh, but we got up and I remember getting to the church and I started putting on my tux. And after I got my tux and I put on my brand new Pumas. And uh, my dad thought I was joking that I was putting on tennis shoes, but I was like, no, nah, nah, I'm, I'm wearing tennis shoes. See, um, Angie had told me earlier on that many brides either go barefoot or wear tennis shoes because their dresses are so long, no one can tell what they have on their feet. And she's like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to be comfortable. And I was like, okay, I want to be comfortable too. Because women, I don't know if you've ever had the benefit of trying on men's tux rental shoes. Okay, think of like the hardest plastic that's the most uncomfortable thing on the face of the earth, tux shoes. And I'm like, I don't want to wear those. And so I was like, she was like, cool. So conditions, they had to be brand new and they had to be black. I was like, not a problem. So I bought my brand new black Pumas. And to be honest with you, no one noticed my new kicks for the longest time. I like, we went through the whole ceremony. No one noticed that they had black laces. It was covered up. However, we prayed during our ceremony. We got down like an altar to take communion together. And when I knelt down, my black shoes went from being black to being bright white with orange Puma right across the bottom. And uh, there was a lot of laughter. Okay, people got a big kick out of that. And we just kind of chuckled. My dad's over there praying and we're laughing. So, you know, that started off great. But, you know, we had a great time. But I got to wear my shoes. But here's the thing about it. That day, I remember so well. I, re- I remember when she stood at the end of the aisle with her dad. I remember as she walked down the aisle. I remember when I got to stand next to her and hold her hand. It was an incredible, incredible feeling. This was my bride. This was my beloved. For those of you married in the room, do you remember seeing your spouse for the first time? Like men, like most of the time when I do a wedding, I love watching the guy's reaction to the girl. And and the girl's reaction is like, oh, he actually dressed up. He combed his hair, fantastic. You know, I mean, they have reactions too. It's just like one more of relief where ours is one of awe, you know? And so there's those reactions. But but then there's that connection. Maybe you've not been married before. Maybe you've been to a wedding. And and maybe like you, you watch people and to see how they're responding, how they're reacting, to see the joy. Like people crying, like they're getting married. It's like, that's not sad. You're getting married, you know? But those tears of joy that people have, have when they get married, that connection that they make. 
It's a beautiful thing to watch. And that's what the Bible says that we are. The church is the bride of Christ. Now, for the men in this room today, this is a hard lesson to swallow sometimes because men are not used to being called the bride, okay? That's not who we is. We, we don't roll that way, okay? We're, 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 we're not the bride, okay? And as a matter of fact, like when you say like, hey, we're the bride, men, like they start doing that chair squirm thing or like, I don't, this chair is not as comfortable it used to be. And then they turn into the, well, let me just sit a little bit taller and puff my chest out because, you know, I'm a man, right? We're good. I'm not no bride, all right? But I'm not calling each of you a bride. We're saying the church, big C church, universal church is the bride of Christ of which we are a part of. And so we get to get this idea of what it means to be his bride. And that's what the Bible teaches us. And I think it's probably one of the most important metaphors of the church is it being described as the bride of Christ. Because those implications are bigger than any of the other implications. They mean more than it does when it was the body. They mean more than it does when it's the family. Because this is a relationship that is second to none in scripture. You see, God designed the bride and groom relationship to be the most special of all human relationships. And likewise, because this is an illustration, it shadows the fact that our relationship with God is the most important relationship that we have in our lives. And that is why divorce in America, divorce in the world is such an awful thing because it destroys the image of what God has put together for a man and a woman to be. It begins to stain what God has intended. So we're gonna look at what the Bible has to say about this and what it has to say about us being the bride. So we're gonna be in Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, which if you've been to a wedding, you've probably heard this read because it's read so often at weddings. But this is what it says. Wives, submit to your husband, our own husbands as to the Lord. For the husbands is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as a church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, as we read this passage, I hope you noticed that there is way more in this passage about Christ and the church than there's ever mentioned about an actual physical husband and physical wife. We're just like a holding spot to be like, hey, this can kind of apply to you. But this is really about how Jesus treats the church. This is about that relationship. This passage we use in weddings because how Jesus treats the church is how we should treat one another. This is the connection piece. It's not like, here's how you should treat one another, and oh yeah, maybe the church should do that too. No, God came first. He established this, and we're to follow that pattern. Jesus is the example, and it's teaching us how we should respond to this. Now, the church is called the bride of Christ, and Christ is declared the head of the bride. In other words, we need to have this intimate relationship with Jesus because a husband and wife have that kind of relationship. That's the kind of relationship we have to have with him. It's closer than anything that we can establish here on earth or experience on earth. Jesus is the leader of our lives. He's the director of our lives. He's the guide who shows his church where to follow, to come with. What's more, and I think this is important to understand, as as the church, as a bride, we're not forced into this relationship. Jesus is never forced anyone into a relationship with him. In fact, in Revelation 3.20, it says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. He should stand there knocking, waiting for you to open the door. In other words, I've come 99.9% of the way. I've given my only son, 
I've forgiven you, I've done all this stuff, and I'm standing there saying, hey, I, what I have to offer you is an eternity of paradise. All you have to do is open the door and say, I, I'll take some of that, okay? Now, this is what's important to understand. He doesn't kick in the door to demand that you be with him. He's God, he could do that, but he doesn't, right? But it also doesn't make sense that we would invite him into our lives and then ignore him. If I don't want anything to do with Jesus, why would I answer the door? Yesterday, cars pulled up in our driveway. Jehovah's Witnesses came out, knocked on my door. You know what I did? I ignored them, okay? I just stayed and sat down and did whatever I was doing. I, I'm not getting up, okay? I don't, I don't have a beef with them for what they're doing. Biggest thing is I, I'm just not gonna answer the door. But if Jesus came knocking at my door, I'm gonna answer it. I'm going to invite him in, and then I'm going to interact with him. Because here's the thing. Jesus is the perfect husband. And as such, he nurtures, protects, and provides for us. He has vision to see us perfected. In other words, he's looking at us differently than we are now. He sees us in a perfected state, and that's what he wants for us, even though we're not there yet. So he steps into our lives and helps us to get there. So understanding that we are the bride of Christ, as the church, our biggest role is to be his bride, what does that mean for everyday lives, right? Knowing things is great, but if you don't know how to apply those things to your life, it's worthless. And that's what we wanna make sure we understand today is that there's purpose in here, there's something that we need to take from this and do in our lives to change our lives and draw us closer to him. So there's several different ways that we can look at this this morning and see how it's gonna impact us. The first is this. As the bride of Christ, we must be subject to him. Now, subject and submission are words we don't like, right? When I read that passage earlier, some of these women in here cringe every time you hear, wives, submit to your husband. You hate it. But you hate it not because you don't understand it. Because it's, here's the thing, you don't understand the words, what they mean. Let me explain to you. To be subject means to voluntary, to voluntary, to voluntary. That means I choose to give the right of direct, uh, to direct me and influence me to someone else. It's a choice I decide to make, okay? Now, we can rebellishly refuse Christ and direction and influence he has in our lives, but that would be both sinful and foolish. So it's clear our best interest is to give him full direction of our lives and to give him full influence in our lives. To submit to Christ does not mean it diminishes us. Rather, it increases us. To submit to him does not rob us, it enriches us. To submit to him does not cause us to be less than, it makes us everything we're meant to be. You see, we submit to Jesus because he's worth submitting to. He is so good that we're happy to follow him. So college football just started, right? And we're enjoying that. Most of us are enjoying that college football started back up. One, it gives us something to talk about at work, and two, we have a team that we hope does well. But have you ever noticed when you're watching a game that some teams face a competitor that is far superior to them, whether it's an individual or a team? And I've seen this happen. I've experienced this firsthand playing sports myself. But you're in there playing the game, and that player does something that's remarkable. Like, like Tom Brady in the Atlanta Falcons. You know, it's fantastic. Too soon? Is it still too soon for that one? If we move past that? I don't, I, I don't know. I'm just asking for a friend if, we, if it's too soon. But, but in other words, you go against somebody who's so great, you're just like, man. And here's the thing. You watch this on the football field. Some receiver makes an amazing catch. The cornerback, when he's picking him up, what does he do? And that was good. Like, I, I was impressed. That was pretty fantastic. Or, or, or after the game, you go up to the quarterback, like, man, you're incredible. It, it was an honor for me just to be on the field with you today. Have you ever felt that? Like, just being in that presence, being around that person was like, that was worth it right there. How bad we lose? Oh, Portland 81 to 9? Who cares? We got to be there. Like, we got to experience that guy. And they're worth honoring, they're worthy of our respect. And that's how Jesus should be in our lives, that he's worthy of submitting to. Like, I'm gonna follow that guy. He, he's worth it. Why would I push back against that? Man, if I was playing football for the New England Patriots and Tom Brady, it was like, hey, I think you should go run this route. I'm not gonna be like, no, you know what? I don't think you know what you're talking about. 
I'm going to be like, hey, where do I go? Where are you with me? Okay, I'm going to go. Right? That, that's how we should be with Jesus. When Jesus says, hey, I think you should do this in your life, we should be like, okay, I'll, I'll go do that. Let, let's roll. Because I trust you. You're worthy of me submitting to. So even when we face hard times and we don't understand what God is doing, because we know he's worthy of it, we still submit to him and do what he's asked us to do. That's what submission is about. It's about, hey, I know you have my best interest in mind, and so I'm going to follow you wherever you lead, no matter what it costs. Another way to understand how being the bride of Christ should affect us is this, that Jesus is the savior of the bride. Now, here's your thing. We need a savior because we were all lost. We were born into sin. We were separated from God. We needed somebody to step in and do something about that. That's why we call him our savior. We weren't as bad as we could be. We could always be worse. But our situation couldn't have been worse. You understand the difference there? We can do a whole lot worse than we do, but the penalty for that can't be any worse. Separation from God for eternity, burning in a lake of fire, that's the condition. And Jesus came to save us from that. Why we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The just for the unjust. And because of his sacrificial death, he can now offer to us salvation through simple faith in him, following after him. You see, Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for her. So we're in Ephesians. And here's the thing about it. Marriage is not a 50-50 arrangement. If you were ever taught that marriage is 50-50, you've been mistaught. Okay, because here's the reason. Marriage being 50-50 means that I have to be on my A game and she has to be on her A game and we're both at 50%, then our marriage can be 100% and complete. But you know what? Most days of what I'm not, I am not on my A game. And so my marriage will be less than. But God calls us to give all, to give 100%. That if I'm giving 100% and my wife is giving 100%, then even if we're having a rough day, guess what our marriage is? Well over 100%. And that's what Jesus modeled for us. Why we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He sacrificed 100% of who he was. And not just who he was in the flesh, but who he was in the spirit. Because when he took our sin and shame, he put on us his righteousness, his holiness, his perfection. He gave us all, every moment, all the time, God gives us 100%. And that's how our marriages should be as well. That we're giving each other our best. That we're giving each other 100% of what we have to make each other whole and complete. And what's more than that is that Christ sacrificed willingly and greatly for us. He loved us unconditionally, voluntarily. And despite the utter lack of merit and total spiritual bankruptcy on our part, he said, I'm going to step in that place for you. Look, at the next way being the bride of Christ should impact us as we go through our lives is this. Jesus' goal for his bride is our sanctification. Jesus wants us to be holy as he is holy. He, he wants us to be mature as he is mature. He wants us to be perfect as he is perfect. You see, he has a lofty vision for you. See, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us is 100% true but he doesn't want to leave us there. He wants to make us the best version of ourselves. The version of ourselves that when he created us, when he knit us together in our mother's womb, he saw us to be. When he's making, he's like, this is a masterpiece. Y'all check this out. Check how amazing this is. I'm sure the angels got tired of it. Oh, he made another masterpiece. Shocker. You know, I mean, everybody is a man. And he's like, that's what I have for you. And sin has robbed us of that. But so Christ steps in and says, I'm going to make you back to that. I've come to make you holy. You see, we are not yet the people God envisioned us to be. So he rescued us and he's not giving up on us. Because in time, we will become those people. The people that Jesus wants us to be. We will be, because of his sanctifying work, holy and blameless, perfect and without blemish, which is what we read in Ephesians, what God's church should be. His whole aim is to be able to present her to the Father. It's perfect, without stain. 
That's why we join up with him. And that's what should change. And the last way we see being, how the, being the bride that should affect us is this, is that Jesus Christ cherishes his church. This is quite mind-boggling. I don't think we use that word cherish very much anymore, but, but cherish is a special word. It's not like I want something. Cherish is like, with everything in me, that is my desire. Too often, when we talk about God, people view God as this cosmic killjoy, Right? that he makes all these rules, that, that God is the king of no, like you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that, you know? And, and we look at this as so much as someone who's against us, someone who we're always trying to impress. We view our relationship with him as performance-based. I gotta do good enough, I gotta work hard enough, I gotta be smart enough, I gotta do all these things so God will be happy with me. In other words, we don't see ourselves as worthy of him. And we're trying hard to live lives that are worthy of him. And this model, this relationship with God is so far from what's really happening. You see, God is not against you. He is immeasurably for you. God is not waiting for you to fail. He's not like, oh, this is gonna be awesome, watch them fail. Not at all. He's aching for us to succeed. He's, he's wanting with his desires to, to us to step up and do greater things. Look at God is not in heaven being like, oh, here's a little grace for you and a little grace for you. No, God's up there with buckets like grace, 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 dumping it out. He's drowning us in his grace. He's covering us with it. He loves you more than you could ever understand how much love there can be. We just have to learn how to accept that love, to ex- accept the fact that he cherishes us and, and to walk in that, to follow him wherever he leads us. You know, for those of you who are older in the room, when you were growing up and your parents were disciplining you, how many of you absolutely loved it and understood every minute of what was happening? Right? How many of you look back when, like, when you were getting that spanking, like, I'm so glad my dad is spanking me right now because it's going to make me a better man. No, you were screaming like, I hate my dad, he's so mean. But now that we look back, we understand what our parents did out of love for us. We understood that they were trying their best to make us the people that we needed to be. And that's what God is doing. Because he cherishes us. He wants so much better for us that he's not willing to leave us as we were. And so he steps in. And he does something great. As we begin to close today, I want to show you one more passage. This is from Revelation 21, 9 through 11. I know two from Revelation today. What's the world coming to, right? It's all good. It's all good. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, his radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. So here we see the church being called the bride, the wife of the lamb. You see, as the church... We are the bride of Jesus who is the groom. But he's not just the groom. He's the lamb. The lamb that was slaughtered for our salvation. You see, he was arrested. He was beaten. He was tried. He was crucified. And and during this whole time, he refused any help from God the Father. God could have sent legions of angels to save him. But no, that's not the plan. In a minute, he could have spoke and everything stopped. But no, that was not the plan. He was not powerless, but he went to death in order that he could rescue his bride. You see, once the lamb was sacrificed, the bride could be rescued. She became a thing of beauty, brilliance, like a very costly gemstone. You see, Jesus was very clear in his mind that if he made this sacrifice, what his bride would become. That these people who were lost from God, who were separated from God because of sin and death, would now be made whole again, could be complete, could have relationship with him, and become that dazzling gemstone. We see in Scripture over and over, it says this is the mystery of this relationship. But the mystery is not really a mystery. It's just that we don't understand fully what Jesus did, how much he took on himself because he cherished us because he wanted to sanctify us, because he wanted to be our savior, because he wanted to be in a relationship with us. You know, the truth is, 
The older I get, the more I fall apart. I, I, I once had like blonde hair as a kid. Now it's gotten darker. And now there's this white stuff coming through on occasion. Not a lot of it. Hardly any. You probably haven't noticed any of it. But, but it, it kind of creeps in here and there. Uh, my body's not what it used to be. I'm not as young and spry as I once was. Tomorrow we're taking the kids to whitewater rafting. This guy's not. He, he's done. He's, he's had his adventure days. He struggles walking because of those adventure days. And so he's not doing that anymore. I'm not what I once was. But the beautiful thing about the church and Jesus is that there is no deterioration. That, that when he steps in, he's going to do something great. See, here's the cool thing. As I fall apart, and Angie and I are still married, hopefully every day we love each other more and more and more. But there's going to come an end to that time. Because one of us, we're both going to pass. But this church never passes. That love for Jesus has for us continues to grow and grow and grow for all eternity. And one day we get to be with him. He gets to present us to his father and say, this is my bride. And God's like, yeah, that's why you loved her so much. We're on a collision course with beauty, glory, joy, and perfection. And that's what we get to look forward to as the bride of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much that you love us. God, and that you love us in spite of ourselves. God, with all of our flaws, God, all the times that we rebel against you, God, all the times that we push you away because we think we know best. But God, you step in and you love us. God, you love us so much that you came and you died for us, that we might have relationship with you. That this chasm that once existed has now disappeared. So God, we thank you for that. But God, my prayer today is that, that what you teach us doesn't fall on deaf ears. God, that you say you stand at the door and you knock. And God, if there's anyone in this room today who's never opened that door to your knocking, God, never opened the door of their heart to say, I need that relationship with you, that today would be a day they would do that. God, this Labor Day weekend, where we, that we would stop trying to do things ourselves and work on our own, but God, that we would take a vacation from all of that and allow you to step in. God, that we would submit to you and allow you to lead our lives. God, that we would just follow you. Jesus, I thank you so much that you love us so much. God, that you call us your bride. And God, that you gave all for us. God, help us to give all back to you, to serve you and honor you in all that we do. God, you need to pray these things. Amen.